the Lord, everybody. Amen. And I mean it, because he's worthy of our praise. Amen. And happy Sabbath to you all. And those who will be watching this, we wish you a happy Sabbath too. And we pray that the Lord would richly bless you and keep you always in his loving mercy and grace. You know, when we think about some of the things that God has done, you know, we understand that he could have done many things just by himself. He didn't need Moses to deliver Israel out of Egypt, except that that's how he wanted to do it. He didn't need Gideon hiding in a wine vat from the, from the, the children of Midian. You know, he could have done it himself. He could have brought his own you know, wrath upon, uh, you know, whoever was oppressing his people or whoever he wanted to discipline. But he chooses people, amen? And oftentimes he chooses people who are unlikely, people you wouldn't think that he would choose because he's not like us. He is God. And his strength is perfected sometimes in our weakness, amen? But saying that, he could easily do it all himself, but he chooses to use people like you and me. Now, I um, saw a short video. It was a you know, collage of different things, but in this video, they had the preaching of a man, and he sounded very familiar. Matter of fact, I thought he was David Wilkerson. You know who David Wilkerson is? The cross and the switchblade guy? You know, they made the movie about the preacher that went to New York and reached out to the gang members way back when, back when they were using switchblades and chains and knives. Well, I guess the switchblade is a knife. But um, so, you know, I, I thought it sounded like him. And then when I looked him up, he is the pastor of that church. He replaced David Wilkerson. So I guess, you know, he was under him for a while, so he was, you know, he sounded like him. But he gave a message uh, about, you know, God's ridiculous battle plans. And I thought that I'd talk about that today after hearing that. I've talked about it before, but <clears throat> to the world, God's battle plans, just his plans, what he decides to do looks ridiculous to the world. Amen. I mean, it really does. Now, I want to give a specific point statement today, and that is we all want to feel strong. I do. I want to feel strong in the Lord. And when we don't feel strong, we may hesitate in ministering to someone because we feel like we're just not strong in the Lord. Amen. But that's when God can use us the greatest, amen? It's usually then that God will use us. When we are weak, we are strong in the war. And that's where he works best. So I want to begin with Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. You know, oftentimes it says in the Bible that you know, before God can really use someone, he has to bring them low. And what that simply means is, is that they, they need to be humbled. And as Jesus said, the greatest in the kingdom of God are the humble. Amen? <clears throat> Here in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 66, it says, Thus saith the Lord, heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house that you would build for me? And where is the place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. And then this is the, the verse that I wanna, wanted us to concentrate on. In saying this, God says, well, let's look at, why is he saying all that? He's saying, okay, you might want to do something for me. You want to build something for me. You know, you might want to minister for me. You know, you might want to do some great service for me. But what can you really do that I really need? That's what he's really saying. Do you think I need a house? 
David wanted to build him a house, you know, and Solomon ended up building the house, the temple of God, one of the seven wonders of the world, you know, but he, he's saying, you want to build me a house? Okay, you can build me a house, but what house could you possibly build me that I could dwell in? I made everything. I made the heavens and the earth, everything that you see, I made. I brought into being. What is it that you have that I actually need? What is it that you have that I did not already create? What could you give me that I didn't give you already? You know, what is it? And so the answer to that is, is our will, our self. Because in that God created us in his image, he gave us a free will, amen? We can choose to do his will or not. We can choose to submit ourselves to him or not. And so when he's saying all these things, here's what he says. What house could you build me? My hand made all these things. Where is the place that I may rest? Can you, give, can you provide for me something like that? And the answer, of course, is no. But then he reveals what we can give to him, what we can provide for him. To this one will I look, to him who is humble and who is contrite. You know what that word means, contrite in Hebrew? It means broken hearted. To him who is broken hearted. How do you suppose your heart gets broken? You know, when David committed the sin with Bathsheba, and then against Uriah by having him killed, by having him put on the front line. You know, he was oblivious to this for a long while. And then, you know, Nathan the prophet came to him and prophesied. And he told, you know, the story about a man who had one little lamb and another man who had all the lambs he wanted, he could have, but he chose to take that one man's lamb talking about Bathsheba. And David was enraged. And he said, that man's going to pay. That man, we're going to suffer because of that. And you know, Nathan looked at him and said, you're that man, David. You. Now, was the Holy Spirit still with David? Yeah. How do we know? Psalm 51. What was David's prayer? Father, you know, he said, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He was broken. When, when Nathan came with the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in David convicted his heart and broke his heart. And he became contrite. And that's exactly where God wanted him to be. Now, why do you suppose maybe God let this go on so long? Why did he let it go on until, you know, David went to the extreme of putting uh, Bathsheba's husband on the front line to be killed. I mean, he could. Now listen, here's the thing, folks. Let's remember this. All souls are mine, thus saith the Lord. Amen. That's Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 2. Every soul will sin. That chapter 18 of Ezekiel says, all souls are mine, says the Lord. If he wants to allow or let a soul die in the womb, he can. If he wants to let a baby die, he can. If he wants someone to live to be 80, uh, 90, 100 years old, he can. It's, his, it's up to him. Because all of us belong to him. Our children are his children. Matter of fact, he calls them that. He said, you made my children pass through the flame when you sacrificed them to the, uh, to the pagan idol Moloch. They're my children. They're not yours. You, you're, they're on loan to you. But they're a creation of God, you know, and I plan their birth. And so he gives us children. He expects us to raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Amen. To teach them his ways, you know, and extremely hard to do in this world, isn't it? Because all the schools are anti Everybody else is going to be against you. Disciplining children is not fashionable at all. You know, now it's, it's abuse, you know. And there was a lot of abuse. There still is a lot of abuse, of course. But just teach what the Lord does us. He loves us. He's gentle with us. But he's also firm. 
You know, we may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but guess who's with us? He is. And guess what he's got in his hands? A rod. <laughs> Ow, okay. <laughs> and a staff, just to gently move you over into the straight and narrow. Well, why? To protect us from what's lurking in the darkness. Amen? That's, that's why. So God looks at someone that has a broken heart, you know, because a broken heart is sensitive to his will. So he says, this is what we can give him. He said, so this, he, he said, you know, you build a house for me? Okay. I might glance at it. <laughs> you know, you do some service for me. You know, you go to Africa and do crusades. You go to India, you do, okay. That's good. I appreciate it. All of these things, but anything that we give God, you know, oh, that's a, well, I'm going to give you a great financial gift. I'm going to build a monument to you or, or something like that. Well, okay. I'm going to feed the poor. Fine. That's good. But you know, God could do every bit of that without us. Did you know that? Did you know that he could rain manna down from heaven right now if he wanted to? You know that today, right now, he could rain food down from heaven. He could, call, he could cause quail to come. He could rain down manna from heaven. He, he could just deliver abundance of grain and, and crops for everybody. He could do all of that right now, and tomorrow there wouldn't be a hungry person on this earth if they just ate. Amen? Is that right? I mean, he could do that if he wanted to. He could do it, but he doesn't do it. He's done it, though. It's not as if it's something he couldn't do, or he's never done, he has done it. And he could do that, you see. And actually, the whole world could get together and feed the world if we wanted to real quick, couldn't we? I mean, we could do that. That could happen. Really, we know that except for people who are held in such bondage by a communist dic dictator or something like that, where we would have access to, the rich nations of the world could come together if they wanted to and go feed the poor. You know, they could drop food out of an airplane, for that matter, even in places where you wouldn't be allowed to go. That could happen. So we can, my point in that is, we can give that to God. We can do that in the name of God. And, you know, but... Uh, he could do that anyway. He could do that himself. But it says here, but to this one will I look, to him who is humble. That's who he's looking. What can you give him? You can give him a humble spirit. You can bend the knee. You can yield to him. You can humbly say, not my will, Father, but your will be done in my life. That's what you can do. You can give him that. Because he's given each one of us a free will. We don't have to be humble. We just have to be humble if we want to please the Lord. We don't have to be humble, but we just have to be humble if we're going to be great or be able to use greatly by the Lord. So he says, this is who I will look to. Not to the one that does all these things and gives all these things. But the one who is humble, who gives himself. Gives his own will. And who is contrite of spirit or has been broken. His heart has been broken by the spirit of God. It's been pierced and it's broken. And you know, you can't break something that's not hard. Have you ever noticed that? Try to break something that's not hard. I mean, you can tear something, you can twist it apart, you can cut it, whatever. You won't break anything. Things that are not hard do not break. So he's talking about, if you're talking about, he's looking to a person who's had a hard heart. A person whose heart, heart has been hardened. And what hardens our heart? Pain. We protect ourselves by hardening our hearts so that, you know, because we've been hurt. We've been hurt by people. We've been disappointed. We felt the pain. And so it's a natural tendency to harden our hearts. If you play guitar, you know, start playing guitar, you'll notice you'll start to build calluses, just hard places on the end of your fingers. And that's to protect your fingers. That's a natural reaction, you see. 
And once, and you're going to have pain until it's hardened. But after it's hardened, there is no pain. But where there is no pain, as far as like in our lives, there's no gain. Amen? We need the pain. You're, you know, a lot of times we run around. We see our destination. That's where we want to go. But we see that if we go straight through here, there's going to be obstacles and there's going to be pain and there's going to be suffering. And so typically what we do is we go all the way out of our way to go around that. It's like, you know, the Jews hated the Samaritans. And for good reason, actually, who lived in the northern kingdom. And Samaria was the capital of the tribe of Ephraim, who was a half-brother or the brother of Manasseh, which were two of the sons of, jo of Joseph. And, um, you know, when the Jews would be on the other side of Samaria, and they would have to go back to Palestine, to Judea, they would oftentimes take a route that actually took them twice as long. Now, they could go straight through and be through and be back in Palestine in three hours by foot. But they often would walk six hours. So they would not go through Samaria, which is why we find in John chapter 4, it's so remarkable when Jesus told his disciples, you go on up ahead, I'm going to Samaria because he had a divine appointment there at the well where he met a woman. A woman who had been married five times and was living with her sixth man. A woman who could only come to the well in the daytime. <laughs> she couldn't come when everybody else was coming. So she walked up a hill in the middle of the hot, the heat of the day, you know. And that's exactly who Jesus chose. Now, is that a ridiculous battle plan? What was his plan to bring the gospel to Samaritan. Well, I'll just go in there and I'll just do some great miracle or we'll just heal a bunch of people and people will listen to me. No, God's plan is, I think I'll have you meet a woman who's living in sin at a well at the, in the heat of the day and you can preach to her and she'll recognize you as the Messiah and she'll go back into the city and she'll tell everybody that the Messiah has come. And she'll preach the gospel. That's who will preach the gospel. Well, that sounds like a great idea. Everybody will listen to her after all. Amen. She's got a lot of credibility. But that's God's ridiculous battle plan. That's how he chose to do it. And that's oftentimes how he chooses to do it. You need to pay your taxes to Caesar. You haven't paid your taxes. Oh, okay. Let me go to the bank. Well, I got, some, I got a stash under my, my uh, pillow or under my, my uh, mattress at home. Just give me a few minutes, I'll be right back. The Lord says, no, uh, just cast a, cast a net out there. Okay, we got a fish in it. We'll look in its mouth. Oh, there's the money for taxes. <laughs> That's how God does things. Amen. But, you know, God looks at a heart that is broken. A heart that says, okay, you know, I don't want to go through the unpleasantries of going through Samaria. So I'm going to go twice as far trying to get around it so I don't have to deal with it. And that's how we are. But a pain is part of it. You know, and, and, and the pain is sharing in the sufferings of Jesus. It's really his pain. It's really not ours. You know, when you come down to it, everything, what's going on is simply the battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. It's a battle between, you know, Satan's army and God. That's what it's really all about. And if you're children of light and if you're children of God, then you're on a side that's going to be attacked by the other side. It's just simply a fact. That's just how it happens. So to this one will I look, to him who is humble and him who is broken 
hearted in spirit or broken by the spirit and who trembles at my word. Now let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> and we're going to begin in verse 1. Paul said, boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. So he's saying, I don't want to boast, but I'm going to, because sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes I have to remind people what I have experienced, uh, what I have suffered, what I've gone through, the credentials that I have. And he said, the Lord taught me in Arabia for three years, you know. I know a man in Christ, and he's speaking of himself, who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. Now, do you hear what he's saying? I'm not going to boast in everything that I've accomplished. I'm not going to boast in the fact that God chose me. I'm not going to boast in all the revelation. I'm going to tell you I had them, but I'm, going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you everything about it. I'm not going to give you any details. I'm not going to do all that. What I am going to do, though, is I'm going to boast in my weaknesses. You ever heard anybody say anything like that? Not me. <clears throat> but I will boast. I will not boast except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Now notice verse 7. Because. Because. Place that in your life. Because. You might say, why? And God will say, because. But why, Lord, why? Because. If he says anything, he says, because. But why, Lord? You know, we may not know what the because is. We may not know what the why is. But it's enough for us to know that there is a why. Amen? But here Paul's wanting to know, why did I have to suffer the thorn in the flesh? And God says, because. <laughs> because of some blessing that you've received. You see. Now what he says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason. Now, this is a reason. In other words, there's always a reason. We may not understand it. We may not even be capable of understanding, but there is a reason. Amen? And it's a righteous reason. And one day when we know the why, like I'm singing the song, Farther Along, we'll understand all about it. We don't now. We don't. And Paul says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, it is for this reason. Now, we could say, okay, you say, well, I didn't have all those. Nobody took me to the third heaven. I didn't hear inexpressible words. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't have all these. Well, you're called, aren't you? You're called out of this dark world, aren't you? Do you know the truth? Are you a saint of God? Has God has, you know, forgiven you and given you the Holy Spirit? Yeah? Well, that's enough. Has he promised you eternal life? Are you in his covenant, a covenant of mercy and grace through faith? Have you received the, received the free gift of salvation? Has he provided for you? Yes, he has. So because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, then there's a reason why we endure anything. Now, we might say, well, I don't deserve that. The baby's going up the stairs. 
you say, well, I don't deserve any of that. Well, you know, it may not be about punishment. Maybe it's not about punishment. Maybe it's not that God is getting back at you or spanking you for some, th- some wrong that you did. I mean, Paul didn't do anything wrong, did he? He received blessings. He saw revelations. He went to the third heaven. That's why he had a thorn in the flesh. It was because of that. Why was Job stricken? And I mean, like no man has ever been stricken, really. I mean, except Jesus. Why was he stricken like that? Because he was righteous. That's what the Bible says. Because he was righteous. No other reason. Because he was righteous. Because of what he had received and what God wanted to give him. See, he had received a lot, but God wanted to give him even more. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. So was this for his benefit? Yeah. Was it comfortable? No. You could even say, hell no. (laughs) You could say that. No, it wasn't comfortable. You liked that, didn't you, Shirley? (laughs) You'll feel guilty about it tonight. (laughs) Uh, No, it wasn't comfortable. I mean, he he didn't want it. He asked the Lord three times to take it from him. He, it, would, it, was an, it was an angel from the devil, a messenger from Satan that was buffeting him, tormenting him. But it was what kept him humble. And it's the reason why he didn't boast. That's why he didn't boast. Did it cause him to feel weak? Yes. But was he really weak? We find out later, no, he wasn't. But he was strong. So it says here, <clears throat> it was because of that, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason. Now, do you, let me tell you, he's put in an awkward situation. And people say, well, you, you who heal others, you preacher, you're the one that preaches faith and healing and deliverance. Why has it delivered you? How come, you know, you're being tormented by this messenger from Satan? How is it that, you know, he hasn't taken that from you? If you're not prayed for yourself, do you not have faith? Do you think that he was being accused of all those things? Well, of course he was. Do you think he had to endure all those false accusations? And what if he said, now he's speaking to the church here, but what if he, to his enemies, he said, well, I'll tell you. The reason why that I have this affliction is because I'm great. <laughs> it's because I've been, the, I've been privileged to be taken to the third heaven, to paradise, and I heard inexpressible words spoken about me. That's probably true. But what if he had said that? <laughs> Boy, everybody would say, you narcissist. Well, they probably wouldn't use that word. But, you know, they would have thought, well, you're full of yourself, Paul. And they wouldn't have received it. They said, well, you know, so that's what you're going to do. You're going you're to blame it on God. Uh, blame, you know, you didn't do anything wrong. Well, neither did Job. <clears throat> and everybody thought that he was in sin. Sometimes God just puts you in that position now. And there's not a whole lot you can do about it. And with me, I, I realize that all you can, you know, really the best place to be, the best place to do, uh, best, best thing to do is what Jesus did. Just be like a lamb led to slaughter. Don't say anything. Unless someone honestly asked you, you know. But just don't defend yourself. Let the Lord, you know, do it. <clears throat> and it's for this reason. What is the reason? To keep me from exalting myself. Why would he exalt himself? Because of the surpassing value of all the spiritual experiences that he's had. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. It literally means to beat me up, to beat on me. Listen, the Apostle Paul, we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, that 
He was beaten. Well, you know, he, he went through that before we get to this chapter. We're in chapter 12. So just the previous chapter, he talked about how many times that he was uh, beaten, that he was stoned, that he was whipped, that he was beaten with rods and, and by, you know, scourging whips. And, and just beaten, he said, without number. He couldn't even count the amount of times that he was just beaten. And he was in dangers. And he was in the, the sea for, a, you know, out in the ocean for a day and a night. And he suffered exposure and betrayal. At the end of his life, almost everybody left him. That's what we see in his last letter to Timothy. All have left me. Demas has, having loved this present world, has departed and left me. So here he's being beat up by the devil. So he's beat up by the world. He's beat up by the religious establishments. He's beat up in the Gentile cities because he's preaching against their, their deities. And he's preaching Christ. And he says the reason was because of the surpassing greatness of his revelations and to keep him humble and to keep him from exalting himself. God was looking out for him. Amen. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses. And he says, why? so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am strong. Now, me, I hadn't got there yet. I know y'all think I have, but I haven't. I haven't got to the point where I can be content with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake, where I can be weakened by those things, knowing that when I am weak by those things, I am most strong in the Lord. Amen. Now, let's think about God's ridiculous <clears throat> battle plan to deliver Israel from Egypt. You know, during a time when the Egyptians were taking the newborn uh, Hebrew babies and throwing them into the Nile to drown or to be eaten by the crocodiles, and you know how that would be. I mean, there would just be these giant Nile crocodiles 20 foot long you know, that would just be there waiting for the next child to be thrown in there. I mean, it's a horrible thing. Now, let's think about, this is not a story. This is a historical account. We're talking about something that actually happened. We're talking about people who will, we will meet in God's kingdom. We're talking about mothers who gave birth to their child after carrying that child nine months. And that child was ripped from them and thrown to the crocodiles. We're going to meet them. And not only that, we're going to hear about that. We're going to hear about, uh, briefly, I think God will, will, you know, all that will be gone eventually. You know, all those memories, thank God. But we will see those people. And we'll see the resurrected babies, too. We will see that. And they will be restored. We'll, we will see all that. And then we will see, you know, Egyptian soldiers that came up in the second resurrection and thought, well, what is this we see in Revelation chapter 12? You know, look, they're not regulated to hell. They didn't know God. And the Bible says that even Jesus said, you know, the men of Nineveh, wicked city, capital of the Assyrians, the Klingons of the ancient armies, you know, 
to put it in the modern speech. You know, they, um, they will come up at the resurrection and condemn the cities of Judah because they didn't receive the teachings of Jesus. Amen? We see Tyre and Sidon, Sidon uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, they'll come up at the resurrection also. And they'll say, you know, and Jesus said, you know, if I'd went there and preached and I've done the miracles there that I did in the cities of Judah, they would have repented a long time ago. And even at the judgment, they're going to rise up and they're going to condemn you. <clears throat> so that means Egyptians too. Amen. That means uh, Greeks. That means the Medo-Persian Empire. That means Romans of ancient Rome. They're going to come up and the books of the Bible are going to be open to them as we see in Revelation chapter 20. And they're going to be judged by how they do from then on, whether they yield or not. And that's wonderful news, really. Because there's been lots of people who lived and died and never had opportunity to know God. But we're going to meet these people. <clears throat> but this is a time, I mean, there was a time when Moses was born. During that time, what was happening is, is they were throwing their babies to the crocodiles in the Nile. And God's battle plan was, I know what I'm going to do. I want to raise up an army. I'm going to raise up an army and I'm going to send them and I'm going to smite those Egyptians and deliver my people. But that's not what happened. Because that wasn't his battle plan. Because you know why it wasn't his battle plan? Because that's a battle plan you and I would come up with. But see, God has to, first of all, he's got to look at it and say, is this ridiculous enough? I mean, is this ridiculous enough? It's got to be ridiculous enough or I can't do it. It can't be my plan unless it's reached a certain level of ridiculousness. <laughs> so... He decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to preserve one of these babies. I think I'll preserve Miriam's, Miriam's baby. I'll just put it in her mind to hide that child for three months, and then when she couldn't hide it anymore, put it in a basket and just slip it out there in the Nile, close to where she knows the Pharaoh's daughter takes a bath. Who knows? Maybe they'll find it and save the child, which is what happened. That was God's ridiculous plan. So Moses grew up as a, an Egyptian in the royal family of Pharaoh. But then at 40, he had to flee because he realized that the Hebrews were his kinsmen. They were his family. And he saw an Egyptian beating one of them. And of course, you know the story. He rescued him and he struck the Egyptian and happened to kill the Egyptian. So now they're after him. So he has to flee. So he goes into the Midian desert. And there he, he meets Jethro. And he becomes a shepherd. The very lowest of occupations. Shepherding and dealing with Dirty, dumb sheep. But, you know, that's what he did. And he's out there in the hot sun. And he's out there in the cold of the night watching over somebody else's sheep. And this place is father-in-law's sheep. And he does this from the age 40 to age 80. So he's an old man. And he's thinking, well, this is what my life's going to be. I'm all right, you know. I mean, I, I love my wife and you know, it's not that bad. It's not like living in Pharaoh's house, but it's not all that bad. And then he happens to see a, something that is so unusual that he just had to see. He saw that there was a fire. He's looking at these, this fire, and he's, you know, this fire, it's in a bush, and it's not burning the bush up. I mean, bushes burn pretty fast. This one didn't, especially in the desert. It's dry. It just stayed burning. And he said, well, i got to go take a look at this thing. i got to go check this out. And so he does. And when he's there, the Lord speaks to him because it is the consuming fire of the Lord in that bush. It is the Lord himself as the fire. You know, we find in Malachi chapter 3, I am a consuming fire. 
And that's what God's love is, a consuming fire. And the Lord spoke to him and said, Moses, take your shoes off because you were standing on holy ground because he was there, holy God was there. And he did. And you know what he told Moses? He said, I've heard the cry of my people in Egypt and how they're sorely mistreated. And they've cried out to me and I'm going to deliver them. So I'm going to send you. Now Moses is thinking, but I'm 80 years old. And he gave him what Carter Conlon (laughs) described as a a four-word sermon. (laughs) Let my people go. (laughs) A four-word sermon. Let my people go. Here's all you have to remember. And here's what God told Moses. Moses, all you got to do is go to Pharaoh and say this. Let my people go. And Moses' response was, I can't talk. I can't talk good. I got a stutter. Well, okay. It might have been a, took him a little while to get that out, but it's only four words. I mean, he goes, that. And then, you know, my people go. He could have done it like that. But Moses... I mean, how hard is it to say four words? He knew how to write Egyptian. He could have just made a little postcard, you know, said that. He could just said to the Pharaoh, look, let my people go. (laughs) Either way, but he, you know, here's what was happening. And this is what happens to all of us. He was thinking, who am I? Who am I, Lord? Who am I that you should send me? I mean, look, I'm old. I'm a shepherd. I'm a little crusty. I'm a little weather beaten by the sun. You know, under exposure at the cold at night. I don't look so good. I remember, you know, Pharaoh looked like he takes baths and milk and honey. I mean, you know, I go there and they're all sophisticated, you know, and here I am. I mean... I don't have I don't have the right clothes for it. <clears throat> and besides that, we're out here in the desert. There's no JC Penny nearby. It's not like I can go buy a new suit. I mean, have you considered this, Lord? You might devise a better plan. But God says, no. You see, if there's a JC Penny here, you might go do, get all dudded up. You know, you might, you know kind of clean up before you go and all that, but, you know, wash your hair, cut it, you know, get a perm or whatever it happens to be. Before you go, put some lotion on your hands or something. But see, that just wouldn't be ridiculous enough. It's my battle plan. And you don't know it, but see, my battle plan's got to meet a certain level of ridiculousness before I can do it. I just don't feel right about doing it. You know, it just doesn't feel like me. If I don't, if it's not ridiculous enough, it's just got to, I've got to be me, Moses. I've got to just be me. I've got to be myself and true to myself. But Moses was thinking of all kinds of reasons. Why, you know, who, who am I to go? I can't go. I can't talk. It's four words. That's all. I mean, maybe the next second time you go in, you just say, Repeat <laughs> what I said before, you know what I mean? But that's not what happened. But he, you know, but you know, God indulges him. He said, all right, you got an older brother, 83, Aaron, and I know he speaks pretty good. Now I want to ask you this. Why didn't God just heal him? Why didn't God just say, to an angel in heaven, take a coal down there and touch his lips like he did to Isaiah. You know, in Isaiah 6. Or why didn't he just say, boop, now you can talk. You know, he didn't. You know why? Was it ridiculous enough? It wasn't. No, he wanted a crusty old man 
who couldn't talk with a stick <laughs> to stand before the most powerful man, the most powerful empire, with the most powerful army in the world and say, let my people go. You know, and you know, when the Pharaoh said, what do you want? And then, you know, Moses would like, do that to his brother Aaron. He said, well, Aaron said, what he wants is like, he said, God told him to tell you, let my people go. That's, that's, that's what. Now, Moses said, how am I going to do that? And here's God again. Another ridiculous thing. What's in your hand? A stick. I got a stick in my hand. I use it for sheep. Well, take that. <laughs> How am I going to do it, Lord? What do you got in your hand? A stick. Okay. Well, take that. That'll do. What do you got in your hand? What does the Lord see in your hand? What does he see in you? That he doesn't see, maybe in somebody else. But you're a part of a puzzle maybe that nobody else can fill. What does he see in you that in that weakness, you think that stick? I mean, Moses, you know what Moses is thinking. I've seen the swords. I've seen the spears. I've seen the chariots. I've seen the, 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 uh, the objects of war. I've seen the power of Egypt. I've seen it. And you're sending me with a shepherd's stick. And so Moses comes. So think about that. Picture that in your head. Pharaoh is told that there's someone to see him with a message from God. And Pharaoh's sitting on his lofty throne. Got his eye makeup. You know, you can't leave home without it if you're an Egyptian. Got to have that eyeliner, you know. And sitting on that throne, you know, here comes, I mean, what do you think Pharaoh is expecting? Well, what did Pharaoh normally, I mean, if, if foreign if representatives of foreign leaders, foreign countries would come before Pharaoh, they would usually come, you know, with a gift. And here comes scraggly old men, 80 and 81 years old all weathered up, cracked up, you know, hair frizzed out, whatever. And Moses holding a stick. They're probably, you know, by the Egyptian standards, because the Egyptians, by the way, were obsessed with cleanliness. And they even always thought that the Hebrews were filthy. And above all, they thought shepherds were the filthiest. They wanted to have even contact with shepherds. Who did God send? An 80-year-old crusty old shepherd with a stick. <laughs> and his brother, who's three years older than him. And they're standing there before the most powerful man in the world, all decked up, dressed up, you know, with his eye makeup on and all. You know, got his staff and probably a glass of wine, sipping on it. And then these guys come in and he's looking. And then, you know, Moses elbows his brother Aaron. You know. And Aaron says, God says, let my people go. And Carter Conlon was thinking, what do you think the Pharaoh... I mean, Pharaoh could have just killed him. So why didn't he kill him? And he was thinking it was probably, he was probably amused too much. <laughs> and I think that's probably a good, I mean, that's probably what it was. I mean, he probably thought, this is pitiful. <laughs> this is pretty pitiful. I mean, here these two guys, these two shepherds are saying, to the greatest leader on the earth, to the greatest nation, the greatest army, let my people go. And they have nothing 
but a four-word sermon from God and a stick. But even then, you know, when Moses was thinking about the sticks, God said, don't worry about it. If you throw it down, it'll be a snake. Well, that's, I think, I mean, all of Egypt would run from a snake, wouldn't they? They've never seen a snake before. Surely that would cause all of them to just flee the land, let the people alone. <laughs> you know, again, ridiculous. Why not just, you, you know, do something else with that stick? But no, I'll make it turn into a snake. But that's God's battle plan. And that's how he did it. Now, after a while, of course, God started doing many miracles and things like that. And eventually, they let the people go. <laughs> now, Gideon, same thing in Judges chapter 6. Here's Gideon <clears throat> hiding. And the Amalekites, but mostly the Midianites, you know, were would come every year during harvest time. And it says they were like <clears throat> locusts on the land. And they would come and just take everything. they just take everything. Just whatever they wanted, they'd take, take from the children of Israel. They, they would come every single year. And so God, and the, the Bible says that the children of Israel had not been obeying him. And so God allowed these things to happen because they were not obeying him. But then eventually, now here's the thing, folks. God started, he decided to have mercy. Amen? He decided to have mercy. They still had not turned to him. There's nowhere in there where a prophet came and said, if you'll turn back to God, you know, then he will take care of your enemies. Nothing like that was said. Nothing was said like that. So God just decided to have mercy. He was tired of it. He decided to have mercy. So he said, okay, who will I choose? I know. I'll choose Gideon. So he had an angel of the Lord come to Gideon while he was there threshing, I think. And I think he was threshing at the wine vat. I'm not sure, but I think so. Which just means he was hiding from them. And he said, oh man, great man of valor. And, you know, Gideon's looking around and saying, are you talking to me? <laughs> Again, God's ridiculous battle plan. And Gideon, and, and you know, God says, okay, I'm going to, I've heard the cry of my people, and I'm going to send you to deliver my people from the hands of the Midianites and the Amalekites that were like locusts as far as you can see on the land, just camped outside of Israel. And I, I'm going to deliver you through them. And he said, who am I? Do you, do you not know, did you miss the memo, Lord, that I am of the least tribe? I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Not only am I the from the, the lowest tribe, the least tribe in Israel, I'm from the least family in that tribe, the smallest one. And not only that, I'm the least esteemed in that family. What you're, you're calling is the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the barrel. You might want to reconsider. They said, no, I think, I think you'll do. I think I'll just choose you. But you know, here's what he told Gideon to do. And Gideon is a timid man. He said, now Gideon, here's what I want you to do. First of all, your dad has a ox, and it's a strong ox, and I want you to go over there and borrow that ox when he's not, don't ask him about it, just you know, borrow it while he's not looking. You may have to do it at night while he's asleep. Borrow it and use that strong ox to pull down the altar of Baal. And then I want you to pull down, cut down the asterisk. And the asterisk was those wooden deities, you know, that, they, that were the female sex goddesses. And so I want you to tear those down. 
So he did while everybody was asleep. The next morning, you know, when the people came out and they saw that <clears throat> their temple of Baal was gone and the asterisk was cut down, they were in furious. And someone said, well, I know who did it. Gideon did it. Gideon did it. And they said, well, surely we're going to kill him. We're going to kill him for doing that. But then Gideon's father said, now hold on just a minute. If Baal is God, can he defend himself? I mean, you know, I mean, if he lets my son, I mean, the least, the bottom of the barrel in all of Israel come and tear down his own temple, how strong is he, you know? Should we fight Baal's battles or let Baal fight his own battle? And so they thought, well, you're right. And you know what? Here's what we find in that story in, in Judges chapter 6. Gideon answered the call, but he was timid. Gideon did not have the Holy Spirit. He was not empowered by the Holy Spirit. He did not have discernment from the Holy Spirit. He was not being led by the Holy Spirit. But he consciously made a decision to obey the Lord. And when he did that, knowing that when he took that altar down, he probably knew someone saw him because they said, they, they, you know, they knew who did it the day before, the next day, the next morning. Said it was Gideon. But he did it anyway. This timid man did it anyway. And since he did that, it says that next morning, the Holy Spirit came upon Gideon. And now Gideon is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And God can operate because the Holy Spirit is God in you, working and using his power in you. And so he told Gideon, here's what I want you to do. I want you, you're going to go out to meet them. So Gideon en enlists People. He has 32,000 people. He shows up to meet the Lord with 32,000 soldiers. And the Lord said, well, that's just too many. Tell them, ask them who really wants to fight and who wants, would rather go back home. So he did. 22,000 said, I want to go back home. <laughs> they didn't have a heart to fight. So 10,000 remain. And God looks and says, that's just not ridiculous enough. Even though the Amalekites and the Midianites are like covering the entire land as far as you can see, and they're trained soldiers. Two, 10,000 is just not enough. Take them down to the river. Everybody get a drink, you know. And it says there that, you know, some lap like a dog. It didn't mean they were laying on their belly, actually. Actually, in the Hebrew, it means that they, they lap from their hand like a dog. And the others sipped. So some lapped with their tongues and others sipped. And he separated them that way. And there was 300 that he chose. And he said, I'll just use 300. So here's what I'm going to do. What's the battle plan? Okay, here's the battle plan. You 300, I want you to take a pot and a lamp. Like, you know, put your fire in the pot, like a lamp. And take a horn. And you go out there to where they are. And then get in, you tell everybody, on your signal, all at the same time, you'll blow the horn and you'll break the pot. And when you break the pot, then it will reveal the flame that the pot is covering. Now that sounds like a plan. That will surely strike heart. Uh, you know, strike fear in the hearts of hundreds of thousands of trained soldiers. They've never seen fire before. I mean, they've never heard a trumpet before, surely. That will do the trick, right? You know? But Gideon was, and Gideon, God told Gideon, he was very patient. He said, now, if you're still a little bit afraid, just sneak down there to the camp of the enemy. Because one of them is going to have a dream about what's going to happen. And just listen. So he's outside the tent, and he hear, hears one of the Median soldiers said, You know what? I had a dream last night. Let me tell you what that dream was. And I know what it means. It's nothing more than that mighty warrior, Gideon, who never had been in a fight. 
mighty warrior, and we're given into his hands. And that just gave Gideon, you know, confidence. And so he said, okay, I'm going to go out there with my pot and my little fire and my horn. And we're going to go out there. We're going to face the enemy. They didn't have a sword, one, or a spear, or even a slingshot. Nothing. And of course, that's what happened. And they captured the two kings. And they killed them. And then later on, they routed. The, the others fled, but they, they even they chased them and routed them later on. And that was God's ridiculous plan to save them. Now, as we close, let's just consider, though, Jehoshaphat. You remember in 2 Chronicles chapter 20? When they were surrounded by an innumerable army, they had no chance at all. And Jehoshaphat gave that beautiful prayer that said, you know, we're helpless before you, Lord. And, you know, but we're your people. And we're just going to rely on you. And here's God's ridiculous battle plan. Here's what you do. Send the singers. Y'all go out there to just meet them. Just walk on. You know, just, just wander right on out there and send, send the singers and start singing praises. And you know, I believe that they were singing about the victory that God had already promised. That's what I believe. And the Bible says that they just, with, they didn't go with an army before them. They went with singers to sing praises to God. And it says when they opened their mouth to sing, the enemy turned on themselves. And when they got there, you know what they found? Dead enemies. But not just dead enemies. They found many things. I mean, they found all kinds of food, all kinds of weapons, all kinds of tools that they needed, clothing, everything. I mean, there was chariots, there were wagons, there was all kinds of things, that blankets, everything that the soldiers needed. Plus, I knew they would, do, they would have taken sandals off the soldiers' feet, the dead soldiers' feet. You know, they would harvest whatever they had. In other words, they plundered the enemy. They took. The enemy came for them. God turned the enemy on themselves and gave them the enemy's stuff. That's what happened. And what was God's ridiculous game plan? Battle plan? Okay, here's what I want you to do. Send the singers. Send the singers. Just start singing praises. That'll do the trick. It still does the trick, by the way. Praising God still does the trick. We've seen more miracles during praise than any other time. Tremendous things happening. We could talk about David and Goliath, a shepherd boy. Now, it is true, and I've preached about it before, that that slingshot David had was a superior weapon. It was one of the most greatest weapons in ancient times. You know, it's. I was amazing when I... You know, I actually read the ballistics of it. That really, it was like getting hit by a bullet. It's that powerful. I mean, the concussion. If you get hit in the head, you could have a helmet on. It doesn't matter. Goliath was hit between here. But if it hit his helmet, Goliath was dead. Because of the concussion. It would have damaged his brain. It would have been a greater concussion that could ever happen like from a football game. He would have had bleeding inside his brain. So God didn't send David out there with a lesser weapon. He had a superior weapon. But still it was ridiculous because he's a shepherd. He's never been in a battle. He's, never, he's not a trained warrior. Goliath was a trained warrior from youth. And Goliath also had, I mean, he had a shield. He had a shield bearer. But he didn't cover. He didn't cover himself up and he got hit by David, but that was God's, I mean, think about it. There's a whole army there. His older brothers are there, and God sends the shepherd boy. Now, also, when you think about what's God's ridiculous plan for replacing King Saul as king of Israel, well, I'm going to pick one of the children of Jesse, one of the sons of Jesse. Well, there was a devil. So he sends Solomon to Jesse's house. And Solomon, not Solomon, but Samuel, and says, God has chosen one of your sons to 
to be king of Israel. And he said, okay, so he brought one by one seven of his eight sons. And the first one he sent in was Eliab, which was, you know, it was illogical. I mean, he would be, he was head and shoulders. He looked like, and Samuel said, surely this is the one. This is the chosen one. You know, but it wasn't. And he went right through, and none of them. God says, no, it's not him. Matter of fact, with Eliab, God specifically told Samuel, I have rejected him for whatever reason. And so he said, it's none of these sons. Do you not have any more sons? Well, yeah. But I thought it'd be ridiculous to bring him in. I mean, he's just a little David. He's handsome. But he's out there in the... He's watching over my sheep. We didn't even consider him. I want you all to understand. That is who God almost always chooses. Almost always. He chooses people that maybe have been through everything. Maybe have committed every sin. Maybe have made a mess out of their life. And he'll turn every bit of that into a weapon, into something good. See, that's how how God works. And he brought David in, and David was king. I know. Let's see. Let's deal with the prophets of Baal. There's 450 of them, and then there's 400 of the prophets of Ashtoreth. Let's send Elijah one man, to confront them all at Mount Carmel. That's a ridiculous plan. Amen? But that's how God did it. Who shall the risen Lord appear to after his resurrection? Well, Peter, of course. I mean, the chief apostle. If not Peter, then maybe James. Or James and John and Peter. The sons of thunder with Peter, the chief apostle. Yes, those were there during, at the transfiguration. Those were there that were allowed to come near in the Garden of Gethsemane when the Lord was suffering in such agony. Yeah, surely it'd be them. No. Who was it? How about his mother? Surely his mother, because, I mean, she was accused of having him out of wedlock. She was accused of fornication, even adultery, because she was always already promised to Joseph. She was falsely accused all these years, surely. She'll get the same first. No? I know. The Lord says, it's got to be ridiculous enough to fit my plan. I know. How about Mary Magdalene? The former harlot in whom had seven demons... Yeah, I'll send her. She'll be the first one to touch the risen. She'll be the first one to see the risen Lord and to touch him. She received that honor. And that's how God works. That's how he does it. And that's how he still does it today. And we find, and I won't go there, but 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which you should read. Paul says, consider your calling, brethren. Not many noble, not many mighty are called. But God has called the foolish of the world in order to confound the mighty. Now Paul, you could say, was mighty because he was a great teacher, surpassing all of his contemporaries. But then God humbled him before he could even use him. Amen. He had to break his heart before he could even use him. So Paul had to become. And Paul said, you know, called himself the least of all apostles. Maybe we'll read a little bit of that. But when you think about, well, y'all can just read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 17 through 30. You you think about the Jesus suffering at the cross. I mean, think about it. He's betrayed. He's arrested. He's beaten. His beard is plucked out. He's mocked. And then he's brought to an illegal trial. 
And then he is scourged beyond recognition as a man. And then he's nailed to a cross. And there's, there is the, the crowd mocking him. The crowd that cried out, crucify him. The crowd that cried out, give us Barabbas. We'd rather have Barabbas, a killer and a murderer, a murderer, you know. One of insurrection rather than this Jesus. And he's on the cross. And when he's arrested, all the disciples, Peter, the, you know, James, they all run. And there's the crowd out there. But you know what? There's three people, three significant people, before the cross. You know, I, I know in my heart, and I think you do too, that Jesus wasn't the only one that was receiving abuse and who, and who was being mocked by the crowd. You know his mother was. You know she was hearing things about, you know, this is your son whom you, you know, had sexual relations with a Roman soldier because that was one of the things that was accused, she was accused of. You know, <clears throat> here he is. You know, they were... And the Bible says in Isaiah 53 that strong bulls of Bashan, those demons, were just mouths just gaping open all around Jesus while he's on the cross. They're just accusing him. They're just saying, you're not the Messiah. You know, if you're the Messiah, you, you bring yourself down. You take yourself down on that cross. Why are you letting this happen? You know? And I know that they were also accusing Mary, the mother of Jesus. And you know who else was there? John, a young fisherman, and Mary Magdalene. It was Mary Magdalene there. Now, look at who is, you know, you got the crowd here. And in my mind, I can envision Mary Magdalene can't stay back with the crowd. She can't stay back there. She can't stay behind it. She can't be in the front of it. She's got to go to the cross. She's compelled to go to the, to the cross. If by any means possible, she can give the Lord whom she loves with all her heart any more comfort. And you know, at this point, she's got to, she doesn't know what's going on. They all thought he was the Messiah. They didn't know he was going to die. Even though he said it, it was hidden from their understanding, the Bible says. They didn't know. They thought he was going to be a conquering hero that would drive the Romans out. And here he is dying on a cross, unrecognizable as a man, after being mocked. And everybody who followed him, who loved him, and who was fed by him, and who was blessed by words that no man has ever heard before, and have received the miracles and seen the miracles, a man who walked on water, who calmed the sea, who commanded the wind to stop, all of this, a man who was adored and followed, and now he's mocked. And now people are happy that the great man has fallen. And so everybody back there is mocking. Everybody else that supported him has ran away. So you got three people. The two Marys and John. And in my mind, I can envision Mary saying, I, I don't know how I can endure. I don't know how I can watch my Lord suffer. I don't know how I can do it. I don't know if I can bear it or not. I'm talking about Mary Magdalene. And I can see her just like, pushing her way through the crowd, just going through the crowd. And I can just in my mind see a Roman soldier try to grab her at the very last and just tear her clothing up here. And she just breaks three, and she doesn't stop till she gets at the foot of the cross on her knees. And she endures watching the suffering, the horrible suffering of the Lord. And I've often thought... You know, Mary was kind of like alone in a way. You know, those demons were saying, don't you know this looks bad? Don't you know there's rumors already that you're having an affair with him? 
Don't you know that already? The Gnostics, you know, and they're, they're say, they say that, you know. Don't you know that? I mean, come on. He's got disciples and you, a prostitute, you know. His mother's not even following me everywhere. You're following me everywhere the, the disciples go. Mary and Martha, Lazarus brothers, not following him everywhere. But you are. See, it looks kind of fishy. It looks kind of, yeah, you know, something's going on there. That's what it looks like. But it wasn't like. Jesus didn't even, he didn't worry about it. Probably needed to be a part of that, to be a part of God's ridiculous plan. It wouldn't be ridiculous enough if you didn't have Mary Magdalene. And even at the cross, it's ridiculous. There she is. And you know, there's no account in the Bible of, of Jesus even recognizing her there and saying nothing to her as she stands here. And I think there has to be some type of a social distance between her and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John, his beloved you know, disciple whom he loved. But he talked to John, and he talked to his mother. And he said, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. So he placed them together. He said, this is your mom from now on. And this is your son from now on. It may not be written that way on earth, but it is that way in heaven. You know what Ephesians uh, chapter 3 says? That there are families named in earth. That there, every name of every family is derived from heaven. And it says, whether on earth or in heaven. And I don't know exactly what that means, but I know that angels don't procreate. So I know it's not talking about angels and their wives, amen. But there are families named in heaven, as well as there's families named on earth. And I believe that when Jesus said that, behold your son, son, behold your mother, that was, that obviously it wasn't on the earth, even though, it was acted out after that on the earth, but that was talking about named and ordained in heaven. Amen. That now is revealed at that time. Maybe it wasn't, wasn't revealed before, but it was revealed at the cross at that time. But I often think about Mary, and I'm, I, I think, you know, how did she feel? She loved him so. She followed him. She left everything to follow him. Just like the disciples. And he said nothing to her. And it was hard for her to watch him suffer. And she didn't want to. And I know those demons were just making her want to just run. Run away. But she wouldn't. She wouldn't leave him. And she was the first one to the tomb. Three days later. She went back and told the disciples his tomb is empty, only two of them even bothered to go look, Peter and John. And after they saw he was gone, they just said, hmm, well, he's gone. I guess somebody took him, so we'll go back home. She didn't. She just stayed, and she wept, and she cried, and she, and she heard a voice. Well, an angel said, you know, what are you looking for? I'm looking for the Lord. Someone has taken his body. And then she heard the voice of what she thought was the gardener. And he said, it's me. <laughs> she turned around. And there was the risen Jesus Christ. And she ran and cling, was clinging to him. And she received the honor. A demon-possessed prostitute was chosen before the foundation of the world to be the first person to see the risen Jesus Christ, the first one ever born again from the dead, and to touch him. But that's just ridiculous enough to be a part of God's plan. Amen. Just like Sending out fishermen and tax collectors. Just ridiculous enough. 
So when we think about these things, God has never changed. That's the way he is. And don't think of yourselves as, well, one day, when I get spiritually strong, when I, you know, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray myself up. When I pray myself up, then I'm going to do something. (laughs) You know, we will never not be hypocrites. We're all hypocrites. We're all sinners, recovering sinners. The sin is not imputed to us. But that's who we are in the flesh, you know. And um, we can't think about, like, what it, you know, what it looks like if we go to someone else to try to, you know, point out a sin or something like that. Because that's why we have to do it in gentleness and in love, knowing that we ourselves fall short of the glory of God every day. Amen. And so we don't do it in an attitude of superior or, you know, let me fix you. Let me, you know, it's all about love and helping one another in love, realizing, you, you know, and the person should know that, you know, the you that's coming, I mean, you're not coming with a condescending attitude or not at all. You're, you're coming saying, you know, I will identify because I'm just like you. I'm just like you. Oh, well, yeah, I believe in keeping the commandments of God, but I don't pretend that I actually accomplish it. That's why I ask forgiveness every day. Amen. So let's remember that, um, you know, God will use us as we are. He'll use us just like we are right now. I mean, who did he ever call and say, okay, now, I'm coming back in three months. Get yourself trained up and in order. It is never, he didn't do that with Gideon, didn't do it with Moses. He's never done it with anybody. That's the way it does. And, what, and here's another thing we need to remember. Maybe the thought from the Holy Spirit will come into your conscious to do or say something that will say, you might think, well, that's ridiculous. Well, the Holy Spirit say, hmm, it's me. <laughs> it's me. That's just exactly what I would say. It's just ridiculous enough. For you to know that it's me. Amen. Y'all rise and we'll ask God's prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the fellowship that you have given us. We thank you, Father, for just knowing your Holy Spirit being here and you guiding and directing us and knowing about this holy time that we are to come together and that we know that you bless us here, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that you would help us to put into our mind, keep in our mind, and to receive with our heart all that has been spoken today and even the songs that were sang today. I ask also that you would be with those who are not with us today or not able to be with us today. And uh, we know that there are people that can't come because of COVID risk. And we just ask, Lord, that you would bring that to an end and prepare us, Father, for this time that we're entering into this great time of trouble like the world has never seen before. Help us to be that people, Lord. I ask that you would forgive all of those who speak evil of us, all of those who malign us, Lord. Or, And I ask all of, for those who are hurting and in pain. And, uh, you know, this is a time where so, so many of us are in pain and and we've gone through so many emotional ups and downs, Lord. I just ask that you would be with all of us wherever we are, Lord, in that. And that we would not turn on one another, but we would turn to one another. And that though we may not be able to walk and fellowship, we can pray for one another with a sincere heart and love. So we ask for your dismissal now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.